This week, we welcome Richard Steyerson, president of M-Cubed and former chief information security officer. In the leadership and communication segment, the million dollar question is cyber risk, risk assessments essential to third party vendor management, how digital tech is transforming business ecosystem and more. Business Security Weekly starts now. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we explore the business of security to improve the security of business. Your trusted source for actionable insights on leadership, communication, and innovation. Get ready for Business Security Weekly. Do you have a website, an external presence, employees, an office? Any of these things can be compromised and attacked. How are you defending your assets? Have you penetration tested your public assets? Start 2018 by taking a proactive approach to securing your vulnerable areas. Black Hills Information Security has been helping companies find their weaknesses since 2008. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com and see how they can help you sleep better at night. Welcome to Business Security Weekly. This is episode number 108, recorded November 26, 2018. It is Cyber Monday. I'm your host, Matt Alderman, here in Colorado, joined by my co-host, Paul Asadorian in G-Unit Studio in Rhode Island. Welcome, Paul. Hey, Matt. Nice to be here today on this lovely Cyber Monday, which I hate that it falls on a Monday because like, we have to work and stuff. We can't be shopping. I know. My Mondays are always so crazy, mm -hmm. you know, between dropping off my son and then our calls in the morning and still doing auto mocks. It, it's just straight through. I haven't shopped at all yet today. We'll get to it. I did some Black Friday online shopping. Got some stuff for the studio. There you go. All right. If you are interested in quality over quantity and having meaningful conversa conversations instead of just a badge scan, join us April 1st to 3rd at Disney's Contemporary Resort for InfoSec World 2019, where you can connect and network with like-minded individuals in search of actionable information. Use the registration code OS19-SECWEEK for 15% off the main conference or world pass. Join us for our webcast with Chronicle entitled Intelligence Powered Malware Hunting. This webcast will be held December 5th from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Go to securityweekly.com forward slash Chronicle to register now. All right, let me introduce our guest for today's show. Richard Syerson is the president of M Cubed and previous, previously served as SVP CISO at Lending Club. VP of Trust CISO at Twilio, and GM Cybersecurity and Privacy at GE Healthcare. His book, How to Measure Anything in Cybersecurity Risk, is the first book to integrate predictive analytics, security, and enterprise risk management. Richard, welcome to Business Security Weekly. Matt, uh, really pleased to be here. Thank you for having me. So we have a, a little bit of a history together, so I should kind of get it out there. You know, um, Richard was a customer of mine when you were at Kaiser doing a lot of analytics work at Kaiser. I was at Qualys. You were formerly at Qualys before that. Uh, and we happened to find out that we lived in the same little town in Colorado called Larkspur, um, where we lived literally like two miles apart before you went back to California and then off to GE, Twilio, and and uh, lending club. So yeah, a little, li it's always good to bring friends on the show and, and have a discussion. Yes. Likewise, uh, it's fascinating. We didn't know we were neighbors. Um, and then we discovered dynamically and then, you know, we became, uh, best buddies. And I remember going and having beers with you at the local roadhouse in our little town of Larkspur. Yeah. And a few, uh, fish fries at the church too. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That was awesome. Yeah, we don't do those anymore, unfortunately. But uh, that's a lot. That's a whole other story. <laughs> yeah. So, Richard, you know what? What fascinates me about your career is this progression um, from Kaiser through. Give people kind of an overview. How did you get started in security? Because I don't think you have. I mean, you have a music background. Um, I know as well because you did classic guitar. I know your 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 uh, kids are are classically trained musicians as well. How did you get into security and kind of give us an overview of your career up, up through where you are today? 
Sure. Um, actually kind of started out of graduate school. I got an internship at a company called Trinet. For those of you who work in the Valley, um, you may know about them. They, at the time when I started, they had about 500 venture capital-backed security companies, about 50 VCs that they uh, supported. And I came in there to help actually with risk management. And during that time, I was getting very much involved with software development using like using the LAMP stack very early back in the days when you had to hand compile and you're always missing a dot so or whatever else. So, you know, came into security with a relatively, you know, experienced development background and risk management. Um, also, my master's project at the time was focused on kind of decision psychology and in integrated um, a linguistic analysis with uh, decision-making processes. So it was maybe more qualitative or framing on decision analysis. So those things came together and started working after Trinet went to work for a portfolio company, a venture capital-backed startup, um, doing security development, building um, vulnerability management and, and IDS solutions. Um, from there, went to Qualys, as you had mentioned, was doing more development there. Working, as you know, Qualys is a SaaS service, so started ver getting very deep into um, developing web services applications and becoming a manager uh, there. And then went to Kaiser Permanente where they wanted someone who really understood vulnerability management, but that could scale out and then automate, uh, you know, to upwards of a million assets, uh, automate their vulnerability management program. And from there I scaled into doing uh, vulnerability management, running all the AppSec penetration testing, um, SEM, and eventually uh, build out their GRC and an early uh, data science program as well, again, because of the analytics background. Um, and continued to uh, skill up, particularly in the analytics side, became very interested, particularly in supervised learning. I think that's what the data scientists, the cool kids call it. We, us, we call it statistics, but uh, became very, continued to be very interested um, in that. And to this day, even though I'm a CISO and have, I guess you say matured into that role, have still seen the area of predictive analytics or call it maybe supervised learning in particular as a a missing element in security enterprise management. And so that has continued to be a theme for me, a theme in my writing, both my first book and now the second book, which will be published in 2019. Yeah, so I think you and Doug got connected when you were doing some of the analytics work initially at uh, Kaiser. Uh, and, yeah. and I actually transcended your Kaiser role at two companies, Qualys on the VM side and then Archer on some of the GRC um, you know, the green plum acquisition by EMC back then. And I think that's when you started really getting into some of the analytics work, which I think ultimately, you know, drove kind of the, the first book, right? Which was how do you measure anything in cybersecurity? So uh, actually started getting involved with business intelligence, BI, you know, doing star schemas, data marts back in the late nineties. So was always interested in, uh, you know, what you'd call more traditional analytics at scale. At Kaiser, though, you're correct. I did make a purchase of Pivotal, or at the time it was Greenplum, and then they got bought by Pivotal, um, a large implementation of their OLAP, a massively parallel processing system, brought on a, a data science team, merged them with an incident response and forensics team, and built out an, uh, an organization, 15 people, give or take, for doing, th this would be your a more unsupervised learning sort of work in terms of data science um, at scale, at a massive scale. But at the time, though, while I was doing that, the, the challenge for me, and still is a challenge, is, you know, how do I think about capabilities? How do I know that I actually have the right capabilities from a security perspective for an enterprise scale? And perhaps more importantly, how do I know they're actually working? And this is, I think this is a persistent question that CISOs have. I'm sure leaders have. I'm, I believe board members have this. Um, you know, is, do I have the right stuff and is it working? And that led me to uh, work with Doug because I realized that the problem space, particularly from an analytics perspective, was definitely more of the predictive analytics or what we'd call supervised learning, looking at uh, large scale uh, regressions and things like that, building models in software. I have more of the software skill. Doug obviously is a, a awesome generalist in measurement, but bringing all that together, including the business intelligence and data science and building more of a, uh, I think a modern capability. That's what the new book is actually about that, bringing all that together, particularly in software. The first book, though, was definitely more of the, uh, when you're confronting irreducible uncertainty and more actuarial in nature. In fact, it's, I'd like to say this, it's the, I'm proud to say and honored to say it's the only book that is required, only security book that is required reading for the Society of Actuaries exam. Um, you know, the thing is, security is now becoming a hot topic in insurance. In fact, 
no pun intended, the, uh, I think it was XL Catlin, the underwriters for Lloyd's of London, that said that security is the best thing since fire um, for the uh, insurance industry. So again, our book is uh, very much oriented towards those sorts. My, my first book is very much oriented towards the reasoning over irreducible uncertainty, large scale enterprise risk. The new one is definitely much more software, uh, data science-y in nature. Got it. Um, and then, so we've always had this little debate, right? And there's and kind of in the industry, but you and I have had this conversation in the past is, you know, there's this, this move to, we need more data, we need more data sources, we need lots of data to analyze this stuff. And, and I think one of the things you talk about a little bit in the book is you actually don't need as much data as you think you do. And you know, I think that's counterintuitive to the way some of us think sometimes in the security spaces. We think we need more and more and more data to get the analytics, but there's there's methods and techniques that don't require you necessarily to have more and more and more data. Yeah, I, this might be a function of training for the security professional because they're the domain that they've exercised themselves in is perhaps a little different than what a measurement expert would deal with. Most statistics, most probabilistic methods um, were invented because people had a tremendous amount of uncertainty. They lacked data. And so they wanted to use um, more mathematical methods to be able to even simulate data where it's missing. I often talk in my, in my do keynotes, I talk about the student T test, which was actually invented by Guinness. And they, it was a methodology. They considered it to be IP. In fact, it was published as the student, uh, uh, or actually the T test, student was the anonymous name used because Guinness wouldn't allow the author to actually publish it under his uh, name. So he's in a sneaky way. He got it out there, but it was for looking at crop yields for making beer where they had irreducible uncertainty, a small amount of data, but they still wanted to make better forecasts so they could actually sell more beer. Um, and I do think that we have a lot of those use cases in security. And actually the problem with security is, is more so about being clear about what the object of measurement is. The reality is we, we, you know, certain problems do require a lot of data. Maybe more of your um, unsupervised models could require more data. But when your problem is about making decisions, when you're trying to make decisions either yourself or an artificially intelligent decision, it actually may not require that much data. So we use statistical methods. We use probability because of our uncertainty, not in spite of it. Most security folks who perhaps aren't trained actually take the opposite perspective. Oh, I cannot use statistical methods because I don't have enough data. That is antithetical or entirely orthogonal from the complete history of scholarship when it comes to measurement. It's actually, again, it's a function of um, education. Richard, <clears throat> Richard, this is Paul. When we deal a lot with uh, metrics and statistics, not just on the security side, but also, you know, we're a marketing and advertising company. And I think that the commonality that I see when people work with any kind of metric is they request or want to work with certain data and analyze in a certain way but it's just completely irrelevant. Like they want data just for the sake of having data. Why is that? And what can we do to help uh, put metrics forth that have actually like actionable uh, results? Great question. Um, well, the purpose of data is then to turn it into manufacturer information, right? Typically so that you're sentient, prosthetics so I can make better decisions and so my other machines can make decisions in real time. But the purpose is taking data and producing information. And the thing that I would say from a security perspective, and particularly from a security management perspective, going back to the GRC space where Matt came from at one point in time, is that you're, you're in supervised learning, you're trying to answer some questions, right? So you're trying to frame a question. You have some object of measurement is this capability functioning effectively? So if you don't start with the actual problem set that you're trying to define, you say, just give me all your data, I think that ends up being a real um, ex expensive, typically a misadventure. And so typically I would say, I would, when consulting with people, I'd say, hey, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Mm -hmm. And if you say, well, I don't know, just give me your data, I'd say, gosh, that's for a consultant, by the way, that sounds like lots of money. <laughs> Great, I'll, let's play. But that's not a real effective uh, approach, I think. We have to be clear about what's the problem set that we're trying to solve, and so what's the hypothesis, and then we go about confronting our hypothesis with data, or as I say, the subtitle of my new book is Confronting Security with Data. But you start with the hypothesis. Yeah, and I think it's interesting when, whenever I do look at data, for example, from a survey, I think it's difficult for people to, uh, and I don't know, I'm, maybe I'm just curmudgeon -y, but like I always point out the bias in the data. 
and I think we have that insecurity too, that we may see this statistic particularly that we did research on and it's really high and we go, well, that's, that's truth, but we're not taking into account how that data was collected and the bias that might be in that data in how it was collected or how it was analyzed. Uh, how do we overcome some of those challenges that we have specifically in security? Well, we're, context we're contextual creatures, right? And so, you know, even to, to denote or make a distinction and call something data is already biased. I mean, if you really want it, it's turtles all the way down, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the question though is, is this anal analytics making me better? Can I demonstrate, empirically demonstrate that having done this exercise, I'm better at doing X, Y, or Z? And so, you know, again, I talk about this a lot, I think as does Doug, um, George Box, probably the most famous statistician of the previous century said, you know, all models are wrong, some are useful. We update that by saying all models wrong, some are useful, and some are measurably more useful than others. If your current model is a, a gut check, right, without any empirical data, and you're just saying, well, my experience tells me that we need to do X, Y, and Z. That is your model. By the way, that may be a very good model. And in fact, going about and collecting a ton of data, um, the ROI on that relatively, relative to uh, you know, sallying forth and continuing with your gut, it may prove to be a bad ROI. But that being said, if we're gonna go through a process of, of doing measurement and doing metrics, the question should be, can we demonstrate that we're actually getting um, better? And again, that's the, the purpose of the new book is, you know, it's called the Metrics Manifesto, Confronting Security with Data. We should be able to confront our hypothesis, mm. almost like we, you know, we, we poke the bear all the time digitally, right? Mm. We're always involved in security. The idea is I'm going to try to determine why this digital application, this enterprise, whatever it is you're producing, you know, how can I break it? How is it wrong per se, right? How does it give advantage to the bad guy? So we're always confronting systems with the, um, the, with skepticism, right? We mm -hmm. say, I'm skeptical. I bet you I can break this. I, in fact, my whole life is about trying to break that and destroy it, and then obviously making it better. We don't take that same mentality, though, to our own capabilities that we're designing as enterprise leaders, as CISOs, like vulnerability management. What would I see occurring specifically that would let me know that my vulnerability management program or capability is better? How would, what do I see occurring that would let me know it's scaling? What would I see occurring specifically that would let me know that it's optimizing? This type of mentality, you might call that the scientific mentality. You might call mm. it, you know, it's how a natural scientist, a physicist, uh, you know, an actuary, and a traditionally trained engineer would absolutely conceive of a process in this manner. And so I suppose this is what I'm advocating for. A lot of words, sorry. No, it's, a, no it, it's really interesting because, uh, you know, we, we try and coach people on what metrics they should, for example, bring to their management to justify security expenditure. What are some of the uh, tips that you can give our audience, you know, whether you're in the CISO role or you're trying to present to the CISO? At the end of the day, we've got to use data to justify some action in security or maybe some inaction. And, you know, people in the past have said, well, you just, you know, you measure how many attacks are being blocked. And I'm like, well, in a lot of cases, I just poke holes in that all day long. So what are some of the like good steps we can take and tips for generating metrics that can help improve security and justify a security project, for example? So I want to make two distinctions. There's the board. You meant, I think you mentioned the board or going after budget. By the way, the board typically, well, maybe behind the scenes they're uh, approving larger um, sure. technology budgets. But um, when it comes to the CISO and reporting to me, there's some things that, I, you know, that I'm concerned with. First of all, I, this is traditional, I think everyone knows this, I'm considered with, concerned with coverage. Are my capabilities having good coverage? Well, that's coverage in depth and breadth. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we can go into a lot of detail. I'll save you with that, but it's depth and breadth. It's a full stack approach. I would like to know where we stand on that. That's fundamental. Um, I, you know, where are we in terms of the burn up and burn down of remedial work or mitigation work, right? Remediation, mitigation. And this is very standard, but what, it's a ratio of the uh, burn down over burn up. This is a ratio and it should be approaching 80, 90, 100% over time. If it's, if it's widening, then we know we have a problem. This is getting very fundamental. Now we get into supervised learning though. You've got the fundamentals. I think 90% of people who actually do metrics are probably doing those first two things. How, are I, how am I doing in coverage, typically in breadth? They don't focus enough in, breadth, in depth. That's where Equifax failed, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and they're probably doing some stuff on the burn up and burn down. Uh, you know, hopefully pretty well. But now we move into how do I go about, how would I go about as a true engineer, as a scientist, as a physicist, you know, 
scientists and natural scientists in particular, how to go about thinking about is this system that I've created, because we, we as CISOs, you know, we're in the job of producing a system that's composed of capabilities, right? And, that, and if we are systems engineers, if we are systems thinkers, those systems should both scale and optimize. When we think of scale, look it up on Wikipedia from an engineering perspective, as the input, as the risk input increases, perhaps it's software releases, right? Maybe it's more systems being deployed. As, that, as we have an ingress of more digital exposure, is the capability if I've created actually scaling, meaning is the output put in terms of control, is that, is that rate staying the same? If it's optimizing, it's actually improving as the ingress is increasing. This is exactly how an engineer would think about a system. We don't think that way in security, unfortunately. And we will as we mature as a, as a, as a domain, right? But we don't think that way yet. We, we actually need to start thinking that way. So let's, to answer that specifically, I talk a lot about a, a capability or a measurement called uh, escape rates. You can Google that. You'll see it used a lot in DevOps. Um, they didn't invent the term. It comes from other sciences. Mm. But the idea of escape rate is what's the rate at which I'm exposing risk? What is the rate at which the system I've created is exposing risk? So we could talk about, let's say, the software development lifecycle. What's the rate at which my system, which is the SDL or SDLC, what's the rate at which it produces exploitable risk in production, right? So there's a, there's a rate or ratio. It's production versus pre-production. In theory, if my capability is working well, that rate will hold or decrease over, over time as there's more software, as there's more releases, as there's more developers, as there's more microservices, right? It, it should be controlling that as a system, but we have to measure that rate. Likewise, the other side of the coin to that rate is what's the actual, uh, we call it engineering failure analysis, if you're an engineer, or if an epidemiologist, you call it survival analysis. What is the rate or time to live of toxic stuffs? Maybe it's miscreants that have cohabitated in your network, or maybe it's actually the rate of uh, until mitigation or time, or excuse me, time to live until remediation. And survival analysis is a curve. But these these two areas, when you shift, once you get past the fundamental ratios of my coverage and my um, was coverage, and then the um, burn uh, burn down over burn up, you get into what are, what again what the cool kids now call more supervised learning. And these are two keys to it. Again, the various um, escape rates. And again, an escape rate is nothing more than the movement of, uh, typically of you know, threats and vulns from a more controlled state to a less controlled state. From maybe, in, if you're talking about DevOps, you're talking about different quality gates, you're talking about pre-production to production, or pre-production to stage to production, or you're talking about internal to external, you're talking about ingress, right, edge, to um, maybe from an IT perspective, you're talking about blocking at edge versus blocking the endpoint, or you're talking about egress, about the, the rate of where the risk starts at endpoint and moves outbound. So all these are various forms of supervised learning and rates. And for those of you who are more you know, technical logistic regression, actually getting into hierarchical regression, fairly complex. And again, survival analysis ends up being a form of regression as well. We don't do this in security, but we should, and nothing stops us because these are, compared to some of the more complex stuff that's happening out there, this is all fundamental. We are not seeing this applied across any sort of GRC solutions. Um, there are people who will say they are doing this, but mm. upon best investigation, I find that they're not exclusively. Nobody is measuring this way. Um, I'm sorry, I kind of went off there. I think about this stuff all the time. I'm like writing a book about it, so I, I, I literally think about it a lot. But that's where I would say where metrics go. Again, these are methodologies that the science is used for confronting hypothesis with data, where you'll see empirical data that's leading you to be able to validate, is this actually working? By the way, if you do some measurement process and you find out, oh my gosh, I can't measure this phenomenon mm. with this methodology, it, it doesn't mean that that hasn't worked. It means you've just learned something. I just learned that doesn't right. work. I'm now smarter. I'm going to go do something else now, mm -hmm. right? So... Well, and it, it sounds like it's a, a iterative process, right? It's a constant process of forming hypothesis and then going out and testing it and using metrics to prove that. And you may come up with something and you're like, well, that didn't really work. But you learn that that didn't work, which is learning something, which I think is important, which I think a lot of us give up on metrics too soon. Do you find that is the case as well? Well, I think the problem, the problem really is this, is that security people, like I've had people say to me, gee, Rich, you're, you really seem metrics focused. And I say, no, I'm very security focused. What are you? <laughs> or I'm very engineering focused. What are you? I think the way I think, I believe, because of my people I've encountered, the type of work I've done, is that the way that I'm conceiving of things, it's not personal to me, it's how the scholarship that comes before me would think about 
hard to measure things, right? Mm -hmm. It's how a measurement expert would think. I actually think security, particularly in this day and age in software defined um, environments where the concept of an asset is a transient phenomenon, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's not, what is a server, you know? <laughs> what, mm -hmm. you know what are these things? What, what about when you're working in completely serverless you know, in environments? You know, what, is, what is risk? How do we measure this? Um, I actually think we are really as CISOs, as security organizations, we're in, in the world where we actually compete with the bad guys on analytics. We really do. Mm -hmm. And um, if we don't come to terms with I mean, an engineer, if, if security is an engineering problem, right? If it is, and it certainly is in part, if someone says, no, it's purely a business problem, I'd say, well, you're wrong. So uh, if, if it is an engineering problem in part, how do engineers think about solving problems? When an engineer is thinking about putting a rocket into the moon, do they, you know, you know, build something really quick and shoot it off and go, did that work? No, they have a tremendous amount of specification, right, that goes into that. When an engineer, a uh, civil engineer thinks about building a bridge, how do they think about that? They think, well, you know, it's got to have four lanes, it's got to carry this much weight, it's got to be able to deal with these sort of, sorts of gale winds and things like that, and they, they go off. By the way, they're not reinventing all this math and things like that um, out of the blue. They have a history of work uh, behind them. I'd argue that security is much the same way. When we're specifying and design, we're thinking about the design of some sort of system, we should be thinking about what should I expect this system to be able to do under this sort of constraint, this sort of call it risk. And I think that we as security leaders and engineers need to start thinking this way. And it requires us to, it probably requires the ingress of more security folks with traditional engineering backgrounds, really trained in, um, I think, you know, design, uh, I guess you call it mathematics as well. I, I don't. I, I think that there needs to be a real change in what is security, and I strongly advocate that we mirror our brethren that are in the engineering and sciences more. And um, to, to the extent that we don't do this, is to the extent that we're going to continue to fall, uh, I think, behind with our adversaries. Yeah, and, and I think the ahead, point man. here is that in those examples you gave. Engineering is, it, it, it's closely coupled, right? And I don't see that in security the same way today, right? I mean, security is kind of this group over here to the side, not necessarily fully integrated with the people that are building, in, in your example, these new software applications, right? So partially what you're professing is that the engineering task of securing needs to be really tightly coupled to the development teams that actually building these solutions. Otherwise, we'll, we'll never get there. It's always going to be this afterthought or bolt on later. And if you're a civil engineer building a bridge and you're not doing the math to verify the load and you do it after the fact, your bridge is going to collapse, which is kind of the state we're in in some respects. Right, right. And that's a good point. I mean, to the extent possible, many of these, uh, I mean, a civil engineer is not inventing the math of dealing with, you know, load bearing infrastructure out of the blue. They have, they have, it's already pre-made materials. And I argue the same with, you know, when you're dealing with a CICD, when you're dealing with, uh, let's say you're going to do 30, 40, 50,000, 100,000 releases, to the extent possible, a lot of the controls already need to be engineered in with the, you know, with the, goal of saying, look, we need to be at a place where we can produce a ton of software, have it in stage, and have it ready for deploy, right? And when you think about that process, what does it take to, to build components like nuts and bolts or what we'd call little pieces of software? What does it take to be able to have that value move through this at a certain rate, right? We have a current customers globally that are that demand, you know, certain amount of feature sets always evolving, right? What does it mean to be able to build a system that can deal with the dynamics of a, a even regulatory threat? You know, we have GDPR that showed up, you know, surprise. And now we have in California, very similar, right? Well, what does it mean to start engineering with the thought, with those thoughts in mind? This is how engineers like, hey, I want to shoot my rocket to the moon. I want to be able to reuse some of that. Maybe I want to shoot something up. As for the satellite or to even to Mars, we need to be thinking that way as we as we engineer, and it has to be done in such a way that it meets the speed and velocity of business. Right, that's engineering again. There is a speed and velocity that we must create software to, based on our business. Security needs to take that in consideration. If our process slows that down, then we're just we're creating you know we're exacerbating opportunity loss. That's a much bigger risk, typically, by the way, than catastrophic loss. And I know security folks are probably like. 
putting pencils in their eyes, but if you actually look at a measurement, the opportunity loss for a large enterprise globally by slowing down the development process, um, empirically, the likelihood is higher, and typically the cumulative um, impact financially is larger too. Yes, catastrophic risk can be horrific at times, but in the aggregate, typically it's, it's the opportunity loss. Sorry, kind of going off in risk world there. But I, it's important, right? Because I think the thing that security and CISOs need to understand is they are part of the risk equation for the business and they have to figure out how to work better with the rest of the organization. It can't be just this separate thing anymore. It has to be fully integrated because you're, it, it's part of the risk equation now as these businesses continue to grow and, and, and thrive. And you can't just you know, kind of put the blinders on and go, this is the only way we do it. And, and your point is it's got to be more embedded in with the core building of not only the software, but the business itself so that security can scale with the business, with the software and not be something that drags it down. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And it has to be, I, again, I think particularly in more of a software defined world, security, I mean, the types of people that I've been hiring in my previous CISO gigs, they've, uh, if you look at uh, both, uh, well, Lending Club in particular and uh, GE in particular, or well, actually Kaiser, is I am increasingly hiring software people. They're software people with heavy analytics capabilities and obviously security tenure. And I, I'd like to think that that's, you know, that I'm special in that regard. But I think as we look in the, the valley increasingly, we're seeing the security folks be that because we need to be able to effectively structurally couple with this software organism or life cycle that's that's evolving now right that's in, increasingly full of third parties and fourth parties that's about you know again you know serverless environments that is actually much uh it's, it's there's a lot more velocity thus creating a lot more uncertainty so we need people who can really scale and integrate into those environments in a non-disruptive manner that means that the, they have to be software they have to be builders they but they have the security folks have to be analytically driven as well i think and so we need to be able to integrate with the engineering process in such a way that's non-disruptive and it actually amplifies the, uh, the magnitude of business, right? We, if we're doing our job effectively, it should be easier for the business to go and sell into a new market, a new market that might have regulatory constraints that we didn't, we maybe perhaps didn't even foresee. Um, so I do think it's a, it is a big, it is a big change. Listen, how boring is it to think, you know, okay, well, we're going to come in now. We're going to do stack and dynamic code review. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to stamp out all these processes, and that's what we're going to do. And there's nothing involved with the concept of what's the business trying to get done from a software perspective. What, you know, what is the new market they're going into? What, how much velocity should we expect? What should we expect from the infrastructure, right? Is it going to be a hybrid cloud environment? Right? Is it going to be some on-prem? Is it going to be, you know, are they going to be looking at AWS, Google, and Azure? Are they going to a microservices, you know, play? What is it going to mean? Are they going to be looking at using, you know, uh, some of the conversations you and I have had in the past? Are they going to be going to something like a Fargate? Are they going to be doing their own, rolling their own kube stuff? What does it mean, and what is the rationale or reason for them doing this, right? Do we need to do more with the control plan? Right? What is it that we need to do from a security perspective? I think these are the types of thinking and thoughts that we uh, need to be having. And we need to be the ones actually involved in being able to write the software and analytically, and analytically determine whether, what we're not, whether or not what we're doing is actually both increasing the velocity of software release and reducing its risk, or what I call helping the business go fast safely. Exactly. Harness risk. Exploit opportunity. Oh, that's an old tagline from my Archer days. Mm -hmm. Paul, did you have any other questions for Richard? Um, I, I think, you know, my last question is really centered around how do you measure the unknown, right? And I think a lot of organizations particularly struggle with this uh, when it comes to asset management. Like, how do I know how much risk is being posed by stuff that I don't know about? And how, how do you measure that? How do you measure the unknown? I, I think, you know, Carl Sagan said the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's completely unknown stuff. That's all the stuff I don't know about, right? I mean, just, I just don't know about it. And um, so uh, I'll give you a good example. There's a company I was uh, consulting with that said, hey, look, we don't have enough data to be able to determine the value of our SDL. Right, in terms of, how, and this is a company that was producing at the time I was there, they're at about 30, 40,000 releases a year. It's a lot. 
And um, in fact, the only thing they were really doing uh, tangibly was they had a bug, they had bug bounty, right? So that's a great service by the bug bounty is great, but if you think about it, that is so end of life cycle. I mean, it's like in production, customer facing external. And that, you know, if you think about shifting left, that is about as far shipped right as you can get in the process. But I said, okay, well, let's see what we can learn about our capabilities based on that, right? Let's see if we can make ourselves even incrementally smarter so we can make some new decisions. So I actually got a hold of the bug bounty data, um, pulled it down from their service, CSV. And I started saying, okay, well, what's, you know, in a year, in a year, if we look at, you know, 365 days a year, how many days do we, do we pay out on our bounties? Meaning where there's one or more vulnerabilities that are exposed externally, that's discovered by a bug bounty expert where we actually have to pay. So I called this measurement vuln day, vuln days or external vuln days. And it looked like on average, the expected value, the mean value for the, the year, the year to date at that time, going back a whole year, was rough, with the expected value was roughly there were 34 days where there was some amount of money paid out. So meaning if, if the rate of software creation were to stay the same, and we're, by the way, we don't know that. And maybe, by the way, maybe the bug bounty people we had were on vacation for all year and we had the, the, you know, the crap team. I, I don't know. There's so much uncertainty there. But can I make myself any better? So we discovered it was 34 days with, us, with some variance. But then I looked at the last quarter. And the last quarter, we saw a 70% increase in actual vulnerabilities discovered. Now, maybe again, maybe an A team got you know, promoted mm -hmm. from the farm league. I don't know. But all we knew is that, that what we discovered is what we're getting 70% worse. Prior to that, they had absolutely no measurement of rate whatsoever. They'd have a vuln, they'd fix it, and they'd do the next one. By the way, they're really good at that. They're really good at that. But they couldn't make any forecast, and I'd be able to say, based on our current rate, what should we expect in the future? And they had no idea that, in theory, they were actually, something was getting worse, right? Again, from causality, it can be turtles, turtles all the way down. Were we creating more software? Well, that leads us to an investigation. Um, did we onboard a bunch of junior folks? Was there a new set of new applications produced that created more risk for some reason? Was there a change in our bug bounty service? Those questions weren't available until we had done the analytics, right? But there's still an uncertainty. But again, uh, by the way, this, the interesting part of this measurement, by the way, is we have hits and misses. A day where there's one or more phenomenon that occurs, an event, that is a hit. A day where there is nothing, that's a miss, going back to the Carl Sagan sort of quote, right? So we're measuring both events and non-events with relatively simple, simple probabilistic approaches. Um, that's, but that's a very tactical example of how we become very resourceful, how we can use relatively rudimentary supervised learning to go about and learn something that we didn't know before, and then use that to actually start asking some new, but data-informed questions. Are we releasing more software, right? Was there something else that's happening that's creating more risk? Was there a change in the bug bounty service? I, I don't know, right? But... All I do know is we're getting worse. And I did not know that before. Mm -hmm. Now I'm smarter. Nobody's doing this in security. Yeah, no, that's a, a really smart approach. I mean, in a lot of it's common sense too, like using what you know to try and figure out what you don't know, which is how I coach people, but your advice is extremely valuable. Well, thank you. Or figure it's out the... what I need to go get next. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. Richard, thanks for joining us on Business Security Weekly. If anybody wants to learn more about how to measure anything in cybersecurity risk, uh, I'm sure you can get the book on Amazon. It is a Wiley Press book. Uh, we'll take a quick break and then cover the leadership and communication articles for this week.